are the VO2 max test. For anyone that's taken one, this probably strike in fear. But in actual fact, there's an awful lot of myths surrounding the VO2 max test. And I want to try and dispel some of those today. You've probably heard the rumors that it's just for the pros, just to check whether you've got Olympic potential, and it can be really, really difficult. Well, in today's video, I want to explain what actually happens, what you can learn from it, and probably why you should consider getting one taken. Okay, let's get started. First of all, let's try and talk through some of the equipment that you might use in a VO2 test. Now, this is sometimes called a CPAT test, so cardiopulmonary exercise test. So depending on the test center that you choose, they might call it by a different name. But I think in common language, we normally refer to it as the VO2 max test. The equipment they use will be something like this, a respiratory mask that you put over your face like this. And this is going to check the flow of air and the amount of oxygen in that air as well. Now, we use a very, a very mobile one called the VO2 Master. Some test centers use one which is attached to a pipe and then will go to a bag and potentially even a big computer. Um, every test center is very different. For what we do here, this works really well for us because we can actually test outside on the bike. But more importantly, for runners, we can actually test in a real running situation outside, uh, which is really important. We can actually test in swimming pools as well with this, so that's why we've chosen this particular model. Um, other bits and pieces that you're probably gonna come across, most test centers are using blood lactate, so you might have someone come on with gloves on and take a blood sample from either your ear or your finger during the test. We have moved away from that, mostly because uh, you can probably imagine the situation when you're breathing really hard and you're pedaling really fast and someone's trying to take a, a blood sample. It can be pretty uncomfortable. The readings aren't always that great and you have to sort of draw a line of best fit. What we've moved to instead of those is using these. Uh, and we've talked about these before on the channel as well. These are muscle oxygen sensors. So these sort of measure the reason why lactate is being produced as opposed to necessarily measuring lactate but these actually give us a constant readout, so we get a constant curve of what's actually going on inside your body. We use two of these, and these are NERS sensors. They shine a little infrared light into your muscle, and they detect the uh, blood cells which are either carrying oxygen or not carrying oxygen. And the reason we use two is we have one on what will be the working muscle, which is normally uh, the quad muscle for most cyclists and most runners, and this is going to see how your body is actually consuming oxygen available to it in the muscle. And we use the other sensor, and we normally put this either on your arm or your deltoid or somewhere that's not really involved in the sport that you're doing. And the reason that we do that will become clear when I go through some of the analysis with you is because we get to see where your body starts to make decisions on where it prioritizes where it wants oxygen. So your body is really, really intelligent and it'll always want to provide oxygen to your brain, your heart, your lungs, your, all your vital organs. It will then try and provide as much oxygen as it can to the muscle that really needs it. And it might do that by restricting oxygen consumption by some of the non-working muscles. So we get to see that big, deeper look, which I think uh, works better than lactate, but other test centers may disagree, but I think we get the results we want. I'll show you in a second. Other equipment we're definitely going to use is a heart rate strap. We actually use the Polar H10, which we've talked about before. And the reason we do this is because it actually measures heart rate variability as well, which when I show you the data, it's just another layer of, layer of data which we can use to just cross check uh, some any questions that we might have. And it can be really, really useful. And of course, we will use a power meter. We normally use the Tax Neo turbo trainers just to provide that power reading as well. Because everything we do here, we want it to be relatable to equipment that you're gonna use out in the field, which is either gonna be heart rate or power meter if you've got a power meter fitted. So you can imagine the situation, you've come in, you've had all this equipment uh, fitted to you, it's been calibrated, it's been checked, and we make sure everything is working and you're going to embark on what is called um, a ramp test. In fact, it's actually a graded step test. Uh, the difference is on a ramp test, you start off very, very easy and we gradually increase the resistance until you hit your maximum, you're literally to the point where you can't exercise anymore. With a graded step test, rather than it being gradual, every few minutes it will take a little step up, it'll take a little step up. And 
before you start the test, your coach will have a conversation with you about how they're going to approach that. We want the test to be long enough that we have a chance for your cardio pulmonary system to warm up and really get to its maximum potential, but we don't want it too long that you and too hard that it instantly floods your muscles with lactate and we don't get the readings that we want. So we try and work a level where you start very, very easy and end up at your maximum and that take in about 20 minutes. If it goes on much more than 30 minutes, it's probably a bit too long. So it's over before you know it, essentially. A common misconception I want to just get out there is that if you're not comfortable going to that maximum, you don't have to in the test. There is absolutely loads that you can learn all the way up there. The actual max values are just one small piece of data that we get from this um, fantastic test. And I'm going to try and show you some of that now. So let's just jump into um, the report that came out from an athlete that we tested recently. This is actually the report that we give you right at the very end because as soon as you take all the equipment off and you've taken your call down, you're going to be full of tons of questions because of course when you've got this mask on, you can't drink, you can't really talk, uh, but you can see all the data happening in front of you and so your brain is absolutely buzzing. So your coach will normally try and answer some immediate questions straight away. That's definitely how we work. We will go and print this report off to you, talk you through some of the headlines, which I'm about to do in a second. And then what we do here is I take a bit more time, do a deeper analysis, and then I get in the front of the video camera, just like we are now, and talk you through in a lot more detail. And that really works because there's an awful lot to take in and you'll want the ability to just rewind, reflect on things before you come back to your coach with questions and a way to progress forward. So this is a report that you'll get instantly. It's got most of the headline figures on it that you really, really want. Now, just a quick look at those maximal metrics. Uh, power and heart rate, I think, are pretty much common language and we all know that that was the max power achieved and the max heart rate. So let's talk about what actually is VO2 max. So VO2 is measuring the uptake of oxygen by the body. Now, what I mean by that, imagine that in the air, only 21% of the air around us is actually oxygen. So every time we inhale, we take in 21% oxygen. So this mask is measuring how much oxygen you breathe out. And the difference between how much you took in and how much you breathed out, can, we can assume that that was used in the creation of energy. Now, once we extrapolate that up, you get to the figure of the VO2 max, which is done by your body weight. So this is measured in milliliters per kilogram per minute. So that figure you see there of 46.2 is 46.2 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. Okay. And with that figure, we can use that to, uh, one, assess your progress, but also benchmark you against other parts of the population and also work out where there are potential biggest gains to be had from your, from your fitness as well. The actual VO2 is actually measured consistently, but we tend to concentrate on this max figure. But I'll show you in a second how the actual ramp to get there is just as insightful. Okay, underneath that, we get to see the three things that make up the, uh, that VO2. So ventilation is the liters of air per minute that you can breathe. So this is measured, uh, taken up by the next two figures you can see, so tidal volume, is how big a breath that you're able to take now. So that is 3.2 liters in one big breath. And the respiratory frequency is breaths per minute, self-explanatory, so 51 times you inhale and exhale in a minute. Now, the max values might be made up of something different. So any one time you could be breathing deeper or you could be breathing uh, shallower and more frequently, but those are just the max values. I'll show you how that they all work together in relation in a graph in a second. Now, the reason most people come for a VO2 test is not to know their max values. It's actually to know these ventilatory thresholds. And if you're following the Steven Seiler three zone model, you'll be familiar with a bit of this terminology. So VT1, VT2, you'll also be familiar with the LT1 and LT2, which is the lactate thresholds. Now, the two are normally billed as being very, very similar, and they are, they're measured differently 
and on any given day that they can move a little bit. So for, for sake of argument, you can call them the same thing. But at these measured values, this is where we see a change in your metabolism. And at VT1, we can see we've got this heart rate of 114 beats a minute. Your power output is 104. It's, it's all relative to size and weight of the athlete, remember. And the calorific requirement is 456. Now, remember that this is actually measured by the uptake of oxygen. So this isn't derived um, or done by any sort of algorithm built into a device. This is measured by the amount of oxygen consumed. So it's a most accurate way you have of knowing your energy requirement at that intensity of exercise. We also have the VT2, which is where we start seeing a, um, an unsustainable contribution from your anaerobic uh, threshold as well. And I'll show you how we work that out in a second. Okay, so next slide down, we just see how your VO2 max compares to others. This is always a useful metric to know. The, the next part down is the training zones, which is the next thing everyone really, really wants from their VO2 test. And these are way more accurate than um, taking your zones from your FTP or your max heart rate because these are actually measured and we know where those metabolic changes are happening because we measure them and we can see them happening in the graphs below. Now, these are slightly different to the ventilationary thresholds and these are actually based on the training potential at those zones as well. So if you imagine that the VT1, VT2 is where we can detect a change in metabolism, these zones are now more about what zones we train in to uh, improve those. Okay. Right, moving down the test, there's a whole load of uh, information that just helps you digest some of the tests before you get that video. Um, the software we use here is by VO2 Master, the people who do the mask. We sometimes use Training Peaks, uh, we sometimes use uh, Perf Pro as well. In this particular example, this uh, works fantastically and it gives you something to take away straight away. Then we start looking at some of the graphs. Now, these graphs aren't particularly high resolution as the one that we give you straight away. The graphs that we see later on, which I'm going to show you in a second, are much better resolution and we can really drill down into that data. But for the most part, these are good enough for what you're looking at. And what we're really looking for in this first day uh, chart where we can see your heart rate, your VO2 and your power, the grey area is the actual graded step test that we did and what we're looking for is to see if this was a successful test, whether we had a good steady ramp of your heart rate, there was no sudden peaks that everything just gradually got harder and harder and harder. So this was a really good test and you can see those VT1 and those VT2 lines drawn on there for you as well. Okay, the, the next chart which I think is uh, particularly insightful, this is where we start to see ventilation, remember litres of air per minute in the dark green line, the respiratory frequency in the light blue line and we get to see the tidal volume as well. And this is where we start to see how you are achieving that VO2 max and you can see that through the aerobic part of the, the test the respiratory frequency remained fairly static, the body wasn't really under any sort of duress it was breathing harder, but as the body warmed up, breaths were getting bigger, which is fantastic. It wasn't until we really hit VT2 that respiratory frequency really starts to escalate and ventilation goes with it. But we also see that the tidal volume starts to decrease. And this is a sign of hyperventilation when we get to those, uh, that get to those elements. So remember, once you pass VT2, that your metabolism has got a bigger anaerobic contribution and that anaerobic contribution produces CO2 which means that your haemoglobin is now carrying a greater amount of CO2 because it's uh, being produced anaerobically which means when you get to that gaseous exchange at the alveoli that um, you need a much more efficient system to be able to dispose of the CO2 and uptake the required amount of, of oxygen which is why we get often get this sort of hyperventilation panicking breathing and you can actually train this to a degree the little bit of breathing discipline uh, you can definitely make a change to that as well okay 
So the, the next chart we see down here is uh, FeO2 over VeVO2. Now, FeO2 is the fraction of expired oxygen. So remember that 21% air that we inhaled, and this is now measuring the exhaled oxygen. And you can see that it's, um, respiratory data is always quite messy, but there's normally lines of best fit or trends that you can detect from this. And you can see that we're being very, very highly efficient uh, aerobically here because um, the, the lower the percentage, the more oxygen that we're essentially using. But once we cross VT2, you can see that the, even though that our ventilation goes up and we're taking breath, bigger, more powerful breaths, that those breaths become less efficient because we aren't uptaking as, as much per breath, which is why you see this graph increase. So the value up here is something like 18%, where the value through here is something like 16%. So there's 2% uh, efficiency loss, if you like, but that's being made up by the fact that we are breathing deeper, breathing more frequently at this level, which comes back to that um, notion that we are producing CO2 anaerobically. The VE VO2 is the ventilationary equivalent of VO2, and this is the marker that we've getting that strong anaerobic contribution in there because our oxygen system becomes less and less efficient. Okay. Um, that's about it for the mask. There's a whole lot of other data in there that I've not gone into, but that's the headline stuff that most athletes are really, really interested in. This next chart is now picking up these moxies and these are measure something called SMO2. Now I'm going to cover this in another video, but you can consider this almost the, the opposite of lactate. So where you'd expect lactate to accumulate, you'd expect oxygen to desaturate because you're starting to actually use some of the oxygen that is stored uh, in the myoglobin in the muscle. Now, the, the dark purple line here is the one that we had on the quad and the light purple line is the one that we have up on the arm. And you can see that once we pass VT1 and we start to have a greater amount of um, anaerobic contribution, then we start to use some of the oxygen that is stored in the muscle. So we start up here in the high 70% oxygen saturation and it gradually desaturates um, right the way down to about 22% in this athlete's case, uh, which is a good steady decline. Still got potential to, to go further potentially with other types of training. Now the interesting thing here is the light uh, purple line which we have on the arm and you can see that once we pass VT2 and the body really is struggling to supply enough oxygen to where it needs it, this is where it starts restricting the oxygen that's going to be provided to parts of the body that don't need it as much. And we start to see in that sudden decline. And this is backed up by these red lines, which again is probably brief for another video, but these are measuring what we call total hemoglobin. Um, and this is showing how the capillaries are restricting blood flow to various parts of the muscle as well. So, and how the cardiac system is able to keep pumping blood to, to where it needs it. Again, for another video, but this is a particularly healthy showing, and you can see the one on the arm there, how it doesn't really start to restrict blood flow until we hit that VT2 marker, so fantastic test. Okay, just want to show you very quickly the, um, the deeper analysis that we get to see, uh, because we can pick up um, an awful lot more learning from looking at those graphs a little bit closer. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that loads, but we can see, for instance, on this graph, the exact point at where the hyperventilation starts and to the severity of it, which is super useful in building training programs to cope with that. We also get to see a deeper look at the FeO2, Ve, uh, VO2, which means that we can actually now start to assess those after we've had a training intervention and see whether we've made an improvement or not. And these are all the graphs just split out so we can see them in a little bit more resolution. Just one of these graphs I particularly want to hone in on is right at the bottom here, and this is the heart rate RR intervals. Now, the R is actually the peak of the heartbeat. You remember those ECG graphs where you have that big peak? So we're actually looking at the intervals in between those. Now, 
when your body is at rest and having a pretty easy time of it, your heart doesn't need to beat very, very regularly. And it can be quite erratic. It doesn't really need to have a definitely uh, defined rhythm. As your body becomes stressed or it's doing intense exercise, your heart needs to become a lot more regular. So rather than measuring the heart rate, this is looking at the regularity of those beats or the variability. And you can see here at the start of the test how the heart rate variability is all over the place. It's quite messy. Then that's healthy to show that your heart is just beating when it's required. Um, as we get into this much more intense exercise, you can see that the heart rate variability drops, which means that the, the gaps in between them are not just becoming shorter, but they're also becoming more regular. And that is the important thing. Okay, <laughs> there's quite a lot to, to uh, take in there. And I hope you're starting to see uh, the amount of data that you can really get from doing a v VO2 test. And I want to really um, emphasize that point of the VO2 test, because I think it takes away the, the maximum thing. You don't have to go to your max. If you're uncomfortable going to that place, you will still learn an incredible amount about your body, which you can then put into your training program or have a dialogue with your coach. If you are happy going to that VO2 max top, you only really learn um, a small amount of extra data. Most of the stuff that you're really interested in has actually already happened by that point. So it's nothing too much to worry about. Now, this is obviously just the start, but once you have your zones uh, really accurately dialed in, and they are normally wildly different to the zones that you might do from taking a max heart rate test or doing an FTP test, it really does emphasize your need for that polarized training and shows you exactly what's happening with your body in your aerobic state, in your anaerobic states, and really gives you some insightful information about how to approach your training. Okay, well, I hope that video uh, was useful. I understand that it is pretty technical. Um, but yeah, let me know in the comments below. Would you like to know more or has that put you off VO2 max test forever? Okay, until the next time, take it easy.